Good morning. You're going to hear today from America's consummate intelligence officer, but first this message. <laughs> cell phones. Please turn off the cell phone. Check your cell phone and get... There you go. Thank you. Yeah. I'm sure you might wonder how it happened that uh, General James R. Clapper is speaking here at Ashby Pond. Well, I'll tell you exactly. Last summer, he spoke to the Loudoun chapter of the Central Intelligence Retirees Association, and that was arranged by Gwen Cohen, longtime friend, CIA colleague, who now lives in Birch Point. I was at the luncheon, having known Jim Clapper for a long time. And Gwen told him about being at Ashby Pond, asked him to speak, and he agreed. Just that simple. <laughs> so now, <laughs> this, is a few, this is a few months later to accommodate doctor's visits, hip replacement, uh, <laughs> physical therapy, things that this audience is familiar with. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I want to thank Gwen, above all, for making this happen. Gwen, would you stand up and let people say, yeah, this, this, she's a, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and also thank the Ashby Pond's Current Issues Group for sponsoring this event. Jim Clapper is a patriot whose service to this country as a military officer and distinguished public servant at the highest level of government service spans several decades since he first enlisted in the Marine Corps Reserve Platoon Leaders Course in 1961. He became a three-star Air Force General, Director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. After uniform service, he became the first Director of the National Imagery and Mapping Agency just three days after 9-11. When Bob Gates became Secretary of Defense, he made Jim Clapper the Pentagon's top intelligence official, serving both the George W. Bush and Obama administrations, and finally as the Director of National Intelligence. So for seven years, he was America's top intelligence officer, heading the entire intelligence community of the United States and serving as the President's senior intelligence advisor. And that, believe me, is an abbreviated list of the things he has done. But let me tell you finally, from a personal perspective, having had the honor of serving with him on a close day in and day out basis, representing CIA, and again under him as a contractor, that beyond the titles, Beyond the huge responsibilities, the huge jobs, this is a really good guy. <laughs> he has a great sense of humor. <laughs> he has a great sense of humor, a truly amazing dedication to sacrifice and service with absolute unquestioned integrity and the courage to meet the ultimate test of intelligence to speak truth to power. He's the, he's the author of an excellent book, many of you know this, Facts and Fears, The Hard Truths from a Life in Intelligence. And I'm glad to have him as our special guest today. It's an honor to finally give him a chance to talk. <laughs> so please welcome to General James R. Clapper. Jim. Well, right, the first thing I got to do is a uh, sound check in the back. Can everybody hear? Uh, yes? Okay. I, there's a note up here about uh, do not move microphone closer to your mouth. <laughs> Speak clearly and in a normal volume voice. <laughs> it will hear you. That's very reassuring. So, uh, what I'm going to do is not talk too long and, and get to uh, what I particularly enjoy in uh, exchanges like this is uh, questions and answers, but 
Uh, obviously, I do have to plug the book, um, uh, which was something I wasn't going to do, uh, even though people had thought it would be a good idea just to write down uh, a history of having lived through 50 years in the intelligence community. But what really, I uh, think, the catalyst for it was uh, uh, what I saw happen during the election in, in 2016 and what the Russians did. And I decided I was going to do my little part to uh, try to explain all that to uh, the American public, um, you know, for those that would read it or, 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 or would listen. So doing the book, I have to pay tribute to my collaborator, Trey Brown, who was my speechwriter for the last three years I was uh, Director of National Intelligence, or DNI. And I would, I'd still be messing around with the first chapter if it weren't for Trey. And uh, we got it done in about a year to include the uh, publication review process. So I actually, uh, it, it, went, uh, went, it went pretty quick. Uh, the whole book experience was uh, fascinating. Uh, uh, one major lesson I learned is I will never write another book. <laughs> um, it was an opportunity to be, uh, it was a cathartic. Uh, and it was uh, contemplative for me. And one of the things that uh, I realized in writing this book and go looking back over the my whole life was the huge impact my parents had on me, particularly my dad. My dad was an uh, Army officer for 28 years, signal intelligence uh, the whole time, uh, which he got into in World War II, you know, collecting messages from the Germans and the Japanese and helping to convert that into uh, intelligence, which had a lot of impact on actually shortening the war. In fact, some would argue that the golden era of signal intelligence was, was World War II. Anyway, when everybody else was getting out, he was so captured by uh, the work that he decided to, uh, to stay in. And this is a setup for a vignette I recount in the book, which I thought I'd share with you, which is when I first knew I was going to be an intelligence officer. So the custom in our family, as, as in many military families, was when you move from post to post, uh, my parents would park us, my sister and me, at, my, at one of the grandparents. So that's what was happening in, 19, in the summer of 1953. I was 12 years old, you, you can do the math. And we were moving from Hokkaido, Japan, northernmost island of Japan, where my dad was number two in a small uh, army signal intelligence unit that was collecting against the Russians. And we were on our way to Fort Devens, Massachusetts. So true to custom, my parents dropped me and my sister in Philadelphia with my grandparents. And they, they went ahead to the next place and found a place to live, got settled, and came back and retrieved us. So I can look at the crowd and understand that many of you are in the same uh, capacity as I am, that is a grandparent. And you know that the first line in the grandparent's job description is, spoil the grandkids. <laughs> so that's exactly what my grandparents did in Philadelphia. And the big novelty was television. We didn't have television in Japan. This was uh, you know, early 50s in Japan. So what a, what a novelty that was to me. I was fascinated by it. And they had this huge box in their living room, big screen, black and white, of course, and four channels. So first Friday night. And they said I could stay up as late as I want to watch television. Wow, that's great. <laughs> so the first night, I watched uh, an old Charlie Chan movie from the 1940s, which I loved. And the movie went off about 12.30 in the morning. I said, well, gee, what else, is, what else might be on? Now, in those days, you actually had to walk up to the TV set and <laughs> turn the selector dial, you know, none of this remote stuff. So I turned the dial between channel four and five, and I heard talking. No picture, talking. So I just stood there and held the selector dial between those two channels, and I figured out that this was the Philadelphia Police Department dispatcher <laughs> dispatching police cars in response to calls. Well, in those days in Philadelphia, on a Friday night or Saturday night, there's all kinds of mayhem going on, so it was kind of interesting listening to this, you know, police chases and 
robberies and uh, domestic disputes and all kinds of stuff. So I stayed up, uh, well, first I got tired of holding the selector dial. <laughs> so I, I ran out to the kitchen, got a bunch of toothpicks and stuck them in the selector <laughs> dial. So it would stick on that frequency. So I, I, guess, I guess they could say I hacked my grandparents' TV set. So I stayed up till three or four in the morning listening to this, and I just found it fascinating, figuring out what was going on and how the police department reacted to various police calls I got. So the next day, I scrounged a map of the city of Philadelphia from my grandfather. And I was at it again uh, Saturday night. And I started, I had the map on the floor, and I started with a pencil plotting the addresses of the police calls. It just kind of interested me. And you know, most police, call, police departments use what they call brevity codes. In other words, 10-4, 10-6, 10-8, and all those. So I got uh, three by five cards and started writing down and I, you know, trying to figure out what all those meant. And uh, then I, find, I discovered that uh, police officers in the grade, a lieutenant and above, got their own unique call signs, uh, personal call signs, to include the police chief. And uh, so pretty soon I'm staying up all night and sleeping all day doing this, you know. <laughs> and I'm keeping records and where they, you know, where uh, police call, calls go. And over time, I figured out, of course, that what the high crime areas were in Philadelphia. And just by the way they, they dispatched police cars, what the police district boundaries were. So I drew those out on the map. And I figured out how many, about how many police cars were assigned to each one of those districts and how they assigned them and all this. So about three weeks later, my parents came back from my, they're up in Fort Devens, Massachusetts, came back to retrieve my sister and me. So my dad, you know, just to make conversation, says, hey, what have you been doing? <laughs> so I whip out my map, my three by five cards, and I gave him about a 20 or 25 minute discourse on the Philadelphia Police Department. <laughs> how it was organized, how it was operated, the high crime areas, the police district boundaries, Who's in charge? How many police cars in each district? It was 65 years ago, but I'll never forget the expression on my dad's face. My God, I've raised my own replacement. <laughs> I like to tell that story, and it's, it's in the book, but for, hopefully humor, humorous, but also make a point about the nature of intelligence work particularly signal intelligence, where you're never dealing with complete facts, you're listening to something that not intended for you to hear, and you're trying to glean understanding of what it is you're listening to. The, the, in this case, the organization and operation of the Philadelphia Police Department. Well, that's kind of the essence of intelligence work, where you're developing hypotheses, you gain, you gather more information, and you try to prove that hypothesis. So, so I guess that's, that was the start of it all. So what I thought I'd do is very quickly run through about five highlights uh, from the book. Most of the book is about 75% or 80% of it is about the last 10 years of my time in the intelligence community. About three and a half years as the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, as John indicated. By the way, uh, what an honor to be on stage here with John. Where is he? There he is. Um, John and I served together and with Liz in, uh, in Hawaii in the late 80s when I was the director of intelligence for Pacific Command and John, as he indicated, was the uh, CIA representative. It was, a, it was a great relationship and we've stayed in contact ever since. So John, thanks again for being here. Anyway, five things in the book. Uh, the, the, you know, the three and a half years is Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence in the Pentagon and then uh, six and a half almost as uh, DNI. So I think uh, the high point uh, despite what you've been hearing lately, the high point clearly was the takedown of uh, Osama bin Laden. Textbook example of uh, intelligence and, uh, the, and partnership between intelligence and special operations. And I will never forget, uh, we were closeted in the White House Situation Room all that day, the 2nd of May, 2011. And when we finally determined that, yeah, it was, we were about 90 to 95% based on DNA that was, in fact, Osama bin Laden, that was time for the president to uh, announce to the country what had happened. So he, he was going to do it from the East Room, and a few of us went, followed him over there. And I'll never forget walking out the door of the West Wing and along the portico of the uh, Rose Garden there, and I opened the door, 
and of course word had gotten out and there was a big crowd in Lafayette Park chanting USA, USA, USA. And boy, it really hit me then emotionally uh, what that meant. It was closure for the country, uh, closure for the intelligence community certainly, and, and, and for all of us uh, personally involved. Now, if you ask Leon Panetta, he'll tell you they were chanting USA, or they were chanting CIA, CIA, CIA. <laughs> uh, if that was a high point, the low point had to, to have been uh, uh, Edward Snowden and the revel his revelations, at the aftermath of all that was uh, a very da a challenging time institutionally for the intelligence community and certainly for me personally. Uh, it was a bad time. And if you're a taxpayer uh, in this country, and I suspect most of you are, uh, you're going to be paying for the damage that, uh, to our foreign intelligence capabilities that Edward Snowden caused for some years to come. I could almost understand what he did if it had only been, if all he had exposed was so-called domestic surveillance. But he exposed so much else that had absolutely nothing to do with foreign intelligence, cap with uh, domestic capabilities, but everything to do with foreign intelligence capabilities, which uh, were very damaging. Uh, I think the most, and I won't dwell on this too much, the most um, frustrating experience, particularly the last couple of years, I just kind of gave up, was dealing with the Congress, which over time just got uh, more and more dysfunctional and uh, uh, really hard to deal with. Uh, you can talk about that if you want, but I, don't, I won't say any more about it. <laughs> the most interesting experience had to have been uh, my trip to North Korea in November of 2014 to retrieve two of our citizens who were in hard labor conditions uh, in North Korea. Uh, it really had a huge, that, I'd followed Korea um, ever since I served on the peninsula. Uh, I was the director of intelligence for U.S. Forces Korea before I met John in, in the Pacific, and I spent two years on the peninsula in that job and really got into things on the peninsula. Uh, and I guess the old saw, you can take the boy out of Korea, can't take Korea out of the boy. So I followed Korea developments ever after. And so it was always a professional bucket list thing to, if I ever got a chance to go to Pyongyang, and I did. And it really had profound impact on my view of North Korea and uh, perhaps, you know, what we might do about North Korea. Uh, again, if you want to talk about that in the uh, Q&A period, I'm happy to. I will say that uh, everything you've ever read about how, what a bizarre place North Korea is, it's all true. <laughs> it, is, it is a bizarre place. But I'll tell you, it was very satisfying bringing our, our two people uh, out. Um, I think the most disturbing thing, as I indicated earlier, was uh, uh, realizing over a period of time the magnitude of what the Russians did to us in, our, in the run-up to the election in 2016. Uh, I've seen a lot of bad stuff in my 50-plus years in intelligence, but nothing that bothered me viscerally more than that. And that was, in fact, um, uh, a stimulus or, or prompting for, uh, for writing the book. Uh, book's done amazingly well. I, I didn't think, uh, I was very skeptical about whether anybody past my family and a few people in the intelligence community would buy it, but it, uh, it's done pretty well. And uh, as I said, I'll never write another one. Uh, so I think I'll stop there and uh, go to uh, questions uh, that you may have about what I talked about or anything else. And I think we have uh, mics available for questions. Okay, we're going to alternate sides and so that nobody gets upset, and I will start, like and then Connie Bubon will, will follow. Okay. Initiative that we're having with uh, North Korea, trying to get them to um, change their nuclear policy, what chance of success do you think this is gonna have? Zero. <laughs> um, <laughs> when I went to uh, Pyongyang, my first uh, White House issued talking point, the first thing I was supposed to recite to the North Koreans was, you must denuclearize before uh, we'll, 
we'll negotiate with you. Well, I was there about five minutes, and I concluded that was a non-starter. They are not going to denuclearize under any circumstance. Well, there is a circumstance, and I'll talk to that. Um, and the reason is because they understand their weaknesses. They, they are rational, by the way. And they know that they regard that as their ticket to survival and that no one would pay any attention whatsoever to the North Koreans if it weren't for the, their nuclear capability. So I think the chances of them denuclearizing simply by our demanding that they do so uh, is, is not going to happen. Um, what I do think is possible, though, uh, and, I, and by the way, I was a uh, supporter of President Trump meeting with Kim Jong-un in Singapore. I thought it was a good idea. And the reason is that when I was in, in North Korea, it occurred to me that the North Koreans were stuck on their narrative and the United States stuck on its narrative. And the only way that narrative could change between the two was if the bigger partner, meaning the United States, changed it. So I thought it was a good idea for, him, for the president to accept the invitation if it was really conveyed to meet Kim Jong-un in Singapore. I thought, though, he uh, kind of squandered the tremendous leverage he had just by agreeing to meet. This is something the North Koreans have lusted for for decades, whether it was Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il, or now Kim Jong-un. I saw that when I was there. A personal, in-person, direct meeting with the President of the United States, something they have long wanted. And they got it at not much, they didn't pay much for that. I also wish uh, the president had asked a question, the answer to which I think would be very useful to know. And that question, which I wish he had posed to the North Koreans, to Kim Jong-un, is what is it that you require so that you don't feel that you need nuclear weapons? So what, what is it you need to make you feel sufficiently secure you don't need nuclear weapons? He didn't ask that question. I wish he had, but it's been very interesting to get the answer. I don't know how we can de design a negotiating strategy unless, they, unless we actually know what they want. Now, that might be a very daunting uh, list, but it'd be useful to, to know what it is. Um, I think the way ahead here for, uh, for re resolving things in Korea actually lies in Seoul. President Moon, for my money, is the most astute president in the history of the Republic. He has managed his two portfolios, the one in Pyongyang and the one in Washington, very, very well. And he capitalized on the intense North Korean desire to be part of the Winter Olympics in Seoul, and he, he President Moon, exploited that. So I think if, and of course, all kinds of good things are happening right now between the, the North and the South. Uh, now, you notice that the North has not exploded any underground nuclear tests. They haven't fired off any long-range missiles. They returned 55 sets of remains from the Korean War. They freed up two hostages. They've toned down the rhetoric. A sight I thought I would never see, having served there, was the image of KPA soldiers, Korean People's Army, North Korean soldiers, and Rock Army soldiers in the DMZ demining. Never thought I'd see that happening. They're now uh, disarming guards in the JSA, the Joint Security Area around Panmunjom, John, and taking down the guard posts. And uh, the objective for between the North and South open up tra uh, transportation and trade and all this sort of thing. This is all good. This is all good. R relaxes, reduces uh, tensions. So the North Koreans, you know, have done all this temperate behavior, and, and importantly, in the Parade commemorating the 70th anniversary of the Korean Workers' Party, they omitted any long-range missiles. That was a very important signal. Now, a lot of people in this country who think about these things are not real comfortable with the fact that countries like India and Pakistan have nuclear weapons. But the fact is, they have them. And the fact is, they've been responsible about them. So I, I just for fun, about six or seven weeks ago on CNN, I suggested maybe we need to rethink our approach to North Korea and accept them as a member of the nuclear club, which they desperately want, since I think denuclearizing is, 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 not, is a non-starter. So how to do that, how to, how to get them to denuclearize, I actually, I actually think the answer lies in Seoul. 
And if the South Koreans can persuade the North Koreans that they don't want to forcefully reunify the peninsula, that they don't want to overturn the regime, but just want a better, more benign relationship between the North and the South, over time, if they, can, if they can be brought to believe that, that might be the path ahead to, over time, denuclearizing. But the approach we're taking, just demand that they do. <clears throat> I don't think that's it's certainly not going to happen in my lifetime, but that's, you know, like many of you, I've clear, clearly around a third base on the home run of life, so <laughs> that may not be very long. But um, I just think that's, pro uh, at this point, is a more uh, realistic approach because I don't see them uh, denuclearizing. They certainly realize, one of the things that, the overarching impression when I was there, it just blew me away, was the strong paranoia and siege mentality that prevails among the elite in uh, North Korea. Uh, I, I, I thought I understood all that, but boy, when I just, it was palpable when I was there. So if you're sitting in Pyongyang looking out, all you see is enemies, particularly when you look south. And what they see is an overwhelming conventional military force poised on a hair trigger at the DMZ, ready to invade them, conquer them, and overturn the regime. That's, that's kind of what I heard. So the secret here is figuring out what it is that would make them feel secu sufficiently secure they don't need nuclear weapons. For the, Ro the South Koreans part, I don't think they, they don't want a uh, reunification in the, uh, in the style of you know, East-West Germany because North Korea infrastructure would be a financial bottomless pit for the South Koreans to take on. So they don't, they don't want that in the first place. So, boy, you asked me for the time of day, this is how they build a watch, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. As a retired Foreign Service officer, I was wondering if you could clarify why the U.S. has been giving uh, Saudi Arabia a free pass for so many years after 9-11 and now with the assassination of the Washington Post reporter. Yeah, I, uh, I think uh, w the stance that we've kind of taken as a result of this latest uh, incident with the... Uh, uh, Jamal Khashoggi, uh, you know, being done away with is uh, absolutely despicable. And, um, you know, our uh, current the administration approach seems to be to bend over backwards to try to excuse uh, the Saudis and specifically Mohammed bin Salman. There's absolutely, anyone has a, I think, a, just a fundamental rudimentary understanding of how things work in Saudi Arabia. The notion that an operation like this in a foreign country to go kill somebody, that that was done without not only the knowledge and acquiescence of Mohammed bin Saudi, but his direction is crazy. There's no question about uh, what happened here. Now, administration has what I've called on CNN an, an elastic evidentiary bar. Uh, sometimes it's raised very, very high, which it will be in this case. Other times, it's very low. So I think we ought to dime out uh, the Saudis for what they did. That's not to say we shouldn't have a relation, relations with them. Yeah, they're a strategic partner and all that. But uh, I, I just think it's really reprehensible that from the get-go, right away, that there wasn't a very strong condemnation and some form of punishment for what the Saudis did. I know personally many people who have been uh, have received security clearances and the months that it takes for that to happen. Do we require a president to receive a security clearance? And if so, what do we do with that? Yeah. Well, that was uh, actually a point of issue when I was uh, DNI. I got uh, cards and letters from people. I got a letter from the Speaker of the House, Ryan, enjoining me not to brief uh, Hillary Clinton when she became the candidate for the Democratic Party. And I have had many uh, approaches by uh, members of the intelligence community not to, not to brief uh, then-candidate Trump when we started briefing up as we, as, as, as has been the longstanding custom. The answer is that uh, n neither I nor anyone else in the government passed judgment on uh, who, who's eligible for a clearance and by way of presidential candidates. The American people decided that. So when they, those, by virtue of the fact they become the candidates of the two major parties, they are by definition cleared. 
That's not an, uh, an authority that I or anyone else in the government has to decide whether they're, cl they're, they're cleared or not. Because I had, I had representations against both the two candidates about not briefing them. Over here. You need a mic? Or I guess he holds a mic, yes. I guess. Yeah. Afghanistan and I suppose Pakistan. Uh, do you see a way forward? We've been there in a uh, basically wartime situation now for many years. Do you see a way forward? Well, it depends on what, you're, uh, what you mean by way forward. Um, if you mean uh, making Afghanistan into, uh, you know, democracy, shining city on the hill sort of thing, uh, no, that, that is not going to happen. We're not going to nation build there. I do think it's important we stay there. Uh, when we had all the debates in the last administration about whether to get out or stay or all that, I, I argued along with John Brennan that we needed to have a presence in Afghanistan if for no other reason than to monitor the terrorist situation there. And once you make that, if you make that determination, that requires a certain foot, uh, footprint based simply on a, a lot of, on the geography and the cultural patterns of, uh, you know, how people live and where they, where they move and travel in, uh, in Afghanistan and Pakistan. So I think some minimal requirement. Now, if you, once you do, if you have an intelligence capability, then that requires protection requires medical uh, assistance, logistics, and all that, so pretty soon you got a pretty sizable footprint just to do that. But, you know, transforming uh, a culture and a society in Afghanistan has been that way for hundreds of years. I don't see that happening. And the other thing is, you know, uh, you know, I've, many in this group will understand this. Is hot? The Duran line that set out the boundary between Afghanistan and Pakistan has actually no meaning from uh, the tribal dynamics that exist there. And that's why you know, we get frustrated with, with Pakistan, who you have to acknowledge has lost a lot of people to terrorism. But the boundary that people look at on a map doesn't, just doesn't have any meaning. Sir, can you comment on the emerging threat of the Chinese Navy? Well, uh, a bigger threat, I mean, I, yeah, I'll speak to the Navy, but, uh, you know, free, FAQ, frequently asked question, what's our greatest threat? Right now, I feel that Russia is the greatest threat to the United States and will be as long as Putin's in power, whether it's the remainder of his six-year term or thereafter. Uh, he is a very strong animus to, to this country and everything we stand for. He's going to do everything he can, as he already has, to undermine us. Long term, clearly, our, I believe our greatest threat is China. A couple of reasons for that. One is their economic power. They are going to overtake us as the largest uh, economy in the world in the not too distant future. One third of the world's billionaires are Chinese. The other reason is, of course, that their scientific and, and technical prowess. And uh, under a subset under that is the uh, aggressive modernization of all of their military across the board, which is designed and keyed specifically to what they perceive as our strengths. So our command and control, reliance on space, they have a really aggressive counter space program. Uh, our bases uh, in, the, in the Western Pacific, uh, carrier aviation, all those kind of things. So part of that is the Chinese Navy, which uh, as opposed to just a what used to be a coastal defense force, now is a first-class navy with uh, global projection capabilities. Not a match yet for us, but they are—they're uh, getting better all the time. And so, uh, Chinese, uh, very, very aggressive. One in interesting aspect of their technical prowess is when they come after us and steal intellectual property, which they do, it comports exactly with the way, what they've laid out in their five-year plans. So they have, a, they have a plan, they have a strategy. They want to dominate in artificial intelligence. They want to dominate in quantum computing. So across the board, I think, on a, a long-term basis, China uh, poses a profound threat to us. Uh 
during your long career in intelligence, can you remember other um, administrations that have been so skeptical of the intelligence community and so quick to uh, both put it aside and even share, apparently share information given to them to adversaries of the United States? Uh, no, uh, the closest, uh, I mean, I've, you know, toiled in the trenches for uh, every pre president since uh, Kennedy. And um, I, I guess the closest uh, I, could, I could point to where there was a lot of skepticism of intelligence was Nixon. Um, but not on, uh, not on this scale and certainly not cases where, uh, you know, he was um, insecure in, in his uh, operational practice such that uh, that poses a threat to our national security. I, I, you know, and I think President Trump has done some things that, uh, you know, pretty reprehensible in terms of, uh, you know, his use of cell phones, which is, as many of you who have served know, that's, that's a gold mine for uh, adversary intelligence service. Um, and his, uh, whatever, however, is it, it's explained this uh, co sort of cozy relationship with, uh, with, uh, with the Russians and with Putin. Uh, I personally don't think uh, serves this country's interest. Does put a lot of uh, pressure on the intelligence community to uh, continue to tee up truth to power, which I think they'll do, uh, whether the power listens to the truth or not. They've got to continue to do that. One thing that you, need, you always need to remember is that customer number one is not the only customer for that intelligence. There are a lot of other people in the government that get the same intelligence. Uh, which may be, uh, you know, saving grace here. But, but to answer your question, no, I can't. Not a direct example. The closest, perhaps, was uh, was Nixon. And I, I was, I was on active duty then when he was president. If MBS is psychotic, we're a little bit off as we've read in the papers, and Daddy is kind of senile, how big a threat is that to world? How big a threat is what? Is the continued presence of MBS in Saudi Arabia if he is, in fact, mentally unstable and his uh, father is unable to do anything about well, it? Well, uh, I've had some personal interactions with uh, Mohammed bin Salman, and uh, first time I met him was not long after he sort of took over as uh, Minister of Defense, and I was subjected to a one-hour lecture about how, th you know, this guy, he's 32 years old, you know, and he's giving me a lecture about how things, are, how, the, how everything is going down. And I, I saw him about a year and a half later, he came, I, this first time I was in Saudi, when I went to one of the many palaces they have, one of these 11.30 at night appointments, and then the next time I saw him, he was here, uh, uh, not too long before, about six months before I finished. And I, I thought he, uh, you know, I thought there was, there was room for hope here. I thought he had really changed his whole demeanor. <clears throat> you know, a lot more, uh, apparent, uh, appeared to be a lot more humble. And I thought that uh, he at least understood that Saudi Arabia needs to reform, and he has a vision for how to reform uh, uh, the kingdom. Um, then uh, I think, uh, you know, a certain degree of arrogance set in here, and he thought he could get away with anything, uh, and I think that uh, that whole image uh, has, has changed. Certainly for me, uh, I, I, I just extremely disappointed. I. I've also, I've said this on CNN, well, is, is Saudi Arabia synonymous with Mohammed bin Salman? You know, the large, the family, the royal family is a large enterprise. And one would hope, maybe I'm being naive or fantasizing here, that the royal family would uh, see uh, how damaging this is to uh, the future of Saudi Arabia. Uh, keeping him in power now. Uh, regrettably, he has cowed uh, and intimidated uh, the royal family. 
so I don't know that that will happen, but that, that would be the best thing, the best situation now would be for him to get out of the picture and go retire someplace. General Clapper, thank you for your, ser your service to our country. What would you do with Russia? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, a lot of people, with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, uh, would argue that we should have been more uh, charitable and more inclusive with Russia uh, when the, with the demise of the Soviet Union. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, you can always go back and do the coulda, woulda, shouldas. Um, I don't know there is much we can do w with Russia. You know, when, uh, when uh, the four of us, uh, John Brennan, Jim Comey, and uh, Admiral Mike Rogers and I went to Trump Tower on the 6th of January to brief out our intelligence community assessment on the Russian meddling, my first and only and last ever sojourn to Trump Tower, I'm quite sure. <laughs> And he brought up with me, well, wouldn't it be great if we could get along with the Russians? I said, sure, if uh, our interests converge at some point. Uh, now, some of my view, view of the Russians and trying to deal with them is colored by my own experience of trying to deal with the Russians, and they are impossible. Everything's a one-way street with them. Uh, we've made some serious efforts over the years to try to uh, share intelligence. Well, sharing for them is, uh, you know, give me what you got. That's it. And the problem I have with the Russians right now, what is it about their behavior that uh, would merit our engaging with them? What they did in the Ukraine, seizing Crimea, Crimea poisoning people, their own people in another country, propping up a war criminal with Assad, uh, then their, their interference in our, uh, you know, most fundamental political process. So what is it they've done to deserve any kind of, and now, of course, violating the INF Treaty. I mean, uh, there, as long as Putin's there, and given his profound animus towards, towards this country, I don't know that there is much we can do. I think our only hope is post-Putin. Do you think that Osama bin Laden could have been taken out before he actually was killed? <laughs> well, yeah, it'd been great if we'd taken him out on uh, November tw or September 12th, you know. But uh, listen, this was a really, really hard problem. Uh, I mean, he, he employed excellent, excellent operation security. He wasn't communicating uh, electronically, wasn't using the internet or any of that sort of thing. And he was very, very meticulous and careful about how he uh, communicated, now communicated using couriers and all this sort of thing. And as a consequence, he was very, very isolated. So the, the only question would, would have been uh, once we were pretty sure where he was, and it was in fact him, and there, that was never a, a certainty by the way, I suppose maybe we could have run the operation, uh, you know, some some days or weeks earlier, but not very not very much. I mean, this was to me a tremendous tribute to the professionalism, the persistence, the patience of a small group of analysts in the intelligence community, notably in CIA, that stuck with this this problem for for a decade, for years. And it, it's a tremendous accomplishment, uh, what, what was done. And then the, yeah, that, that's you. Um, and then the, the professionalism exhibited by our special operations forces. You know, for them, it's kind of, you know, the way they ran that was just like another day at the office. Because they'd done the same kind of evolutions over and over again in Afghanistan and Iraq. It was just, this one was, <laughs> you know, a little bigger target than normal. But the operational, uh, the tactics, techniques, and procedures they use is something they'd, they'd honed for, for years. So it was really, a, 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 for me, I would characterize as, as the highlight, the high point for, for my whole career, for 50 plus years in intelligence. Um, so, you know, could we have done it a little earlier? Maybe, but not much earlier. 
uh, because of the, we had a lot of, we agonized over, was it really him? And I have to say, regardless of how you feel about President Obama, he made a very courageous decision to go ahead with that raid because he did not have uh, unanimity among his advisors about whether, whether we should do it and how we should do it. And he, he made a, a, a very, uh, I think, a very, a very, very courageous call uh, to go ahead and do it. What's the state of your relationship with the president, assuming there, assuming there is one? It, it ain't. <laughs> I, I don't. I mean, the only uh, relationship I have with uh, uh, with President Trump now is uh, occasional uh, tweet subject, <laughs> which actually is good because every time uh, he does a tweet on me, it sells more books. <laughs> Uh, as far as I know, I, I, uh, I still have my clearance, uh, you know, I guess. Uh, I, I've not used it uh, since I left. Um, so my last contact with him was on the uh, 10th of January of 2017, after he referred to the uh, intelligence community as Nazis. And I felt I could not let that pass and that I had to calling on it, so I, I asked my secretary to you know, see if he can track down where, uh, where uh, a number to call at Trump Tower, and, and amazingly, he took the call. Yeah, that blew me away. I tried to impart, I tried to appeal when I did that to his, what I hope were his higher motives, and I told him that he was inheriting what I consider a national treasure in the form of the intelligence community. The intelligence community stood, stood ready to support him any way it could, provide him as much timely, accurate, relevant, anticipatory intelligence as possible for the difficult decisions uh, that he was going to have to make. I just felt I had to say that. And, I, and then when I heard that the first place he was going to go after the inauguration was CIA, I thought, gee, maybe I got through. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> You mentioned the Ukraine earlier, and I've always wondered why the uh, administration didn't come to the aid when the Russians' uh, so-called annexation um, by arms or troops or you something. You mean Crimea? Yes. You speak in the Crimea, yeah. Well, that was a, that was a big debate point. Um, I got in a little trouble with the White House because uh, Senator McCain once asked me, um, as he was wont to do, about... Uh, Arm, giving the Ukrainians offensive weapons, uh, which I was personally an advocate for, and the offensive weapons to defend themselves. And that was just not the, uh, the policy position. Uh, and I, I, have to, I have to hasten to add here that I always tried to play it straight in terms of the role of intelligence, not, you know, not trying to stay out of the policy process, which uh, I found is you know, the higher up the food chain you went, the harder that was. But I tried very hard to do that. That just wasn't the administration's policy then to uh, uh, arm uh, or provide. I mean, we provide a lot of help to the Ukrainians, particularly in the, in the intelligence realm, which you don't hear much about, which is kind of risky given the fact that the Ukrainian intelligence at the time was penetrated badly by the Russians. But nevertheless, we, we helped them out. So, the, yeah. Uh, Personal opinion, I, I wish we'd been um, a, a more aggressive. What would be your counsel, sir, with regard to the, uh, the uh, cooperation between uh, the social media, Facebook, et cetera, and the government with regard to protecting our elections right. process and the information leading thereto? Well, this is, uh, maybe in this crowd's okay, uh, you know, you, you know you're old when you get a grandchild in the business. My, my uh, grandson works at CIA, and he, uh, he's a millennial, and he needs lots of feedback, so he doesn't agree with what I'm going to say now, but I believe that uh, the social media platforms need regulation. 
Um, we have a, you know, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, was stood up in the 1920s, I think, to regulate radio and later television, both from a technical as well as a substance sta content standpoint. We have nothing, nothing comparable to that for the social media platforms. And when you consider the uh, huge impact that social media has on our society, our, our culture, our way of life, and and we're going to depend on them to regulate themselves. As we've seen, that will be, uh, I'll say, uneven. So I think there needs to be a relationship, uh, and that needs, it needs to be regulatory. Now, having said that, I have to acknowledge that, and uh, the specifics of that will be hard, because you're running into uh, free speech, uh, First Amendment rights. But nevertheless, I, I just think that things like this ad was paid for by a Russian agent should be out there so people know that, which wasn't the case in the run-up to our election. <laughs> I'm wondering what your thoughts are about uh, in order to, ha to decrease our dependence on Saudi Arabia to so-called contain Iran, what would be the possibility and what hopes would you have for improving our relationship with Iran? That's great. That is an excellent question. In this case, what can we do to improve the relationship with Iran? Well, uh, once again, uh, I'll, I'll do respect here, but I, I thought withdrawing from what's called the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action with the nuclear deal with Iran was a huge mistake. Not that the agreement was perfect, certainly it wasn't, but I thought that would be useful leverage uh, to keep in force and, and use that as a basis for getting after some of the other nefarious behavior uh, the Iranians are famous for. What's, and the re one of the major reasons uh, I was upset, uh, disturbed about it was because what we did plays to the hardliner narrative in Iran. And there is a, a revolution of sorts on, underfoot in, in Iran today because mainly led by young people. There's a huge population bulge in Iran of young people, pr principally young, disaffected males, unemployed, uh, who are very frustrated. And they want reform. They want Western culture. And we could have used the JCPOA as a way of uh, getting at that. I believe Iran, the, the moderates, not so much the theocrats, but the moderate secular people actually want to be a part of the international community and particularly the international economic community. And that came out during the course of the negotiations for the JCPOA. And by the way, why should North Korea enter into any kind of a nuclear deal with us, watching what we've done with Iran? So I think there was p great potential for uh, getting Iran to, without respect to regime change or any of that stuff, but getting Iran to moderate its behavior because of their desire to be a part of the economic uh, the economic, the international economic community. General, one threat that I feel personally that exists to the United States security today is the vulnerability of the GPS system. Civilians and military now depend totally on GPS and it can be taken out fairly easily. I'm wondering what the thinking is for a navigation system as a standby in the event GPS is disabled. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I guess uh, good old uh, SO maps, I suppose, as we used to use. <laughs> uh, that's a great, it's a good question. Uh, th that is a, a, a vulnerability, again, given the, the tremendous uh, dependence uh, we all have. On, on, the, on what the military has. And, and there are, you know, the military perspective, I'm not up on, on this, but the, there are efforts afoot to uh, secure GPS for military purposes. One thing about 
when we think about all, all of our vulnerabilities uh, as a nation state, well, the adversaries have similar vulnerabilities. That's one, that's one thing that, you know, is kind of a saving grace, particularly with respect to Russia and China. You know, they, they're very formidable and they're threatening and all that, but they too have vulnerabilities like this one. And uh, so, yeah, that's a problem and I don't have any uh, good reassuring words for you. The question was asked, what about Russia? My question is, what about the United States? Where do you see, how do you see our future, our immediate future? So, um, also a good question, what's the future of the United States? The only uh, argument, the only debate that my collaborator and I had on the book, my book, was how to end it. And we really had a pretty uh, nasty exchange. The first time we had any kind of disagreement like that the, the whole year. So we wrote a uh, very dark projection, very dark pro prognosis about the United States. Didn't like that. Then we wrote a, a happy face version, <laughs> and we didn't like that. So we had our, our managing editor uh, at Viking was, was great. Uh, he, he kind of refereed between the two of us. So I ended up saying that the United States has survived traumas in the past, notably the Civil War and a trauma that I lived through, and I suspect some of you did, uh, Southeast Asia conflict. And in the end, we actually emerged uh, the stronger and the better for both those experiences. And we just stopped. <laughs> uh, I, you know, how, the, how all this is going to turn out, I, I really don't know. In the United States, so far, I think, by and large, our uh, institutions have been pretty resilient. You know, Mike Hayden, in his second book, I have great admiration for anybody who can write one, more than one book. <laughs> It's called Assault on Intelligence, a double meaning there. And Mike makes a great point, which I've, I've, I've quoted him or paraphrased him in my uh, public appearances ar around the country, and that is what's really bad here is the assault on truth. And those endeavors that depend on truth, like science, like academics, like journalism, like law enforcement, like intelligence community, just to name five. And the, though all those institutions which depend in one degree or another on fact, empirical data, on reality, are all under assault in one way or another. And that to me is kind of the overarching worry or concern I have about what we're, what we're seeing now. And I hope and pray that uh, as we have in the past survived serious national traumas that we'll survive this one too. You alluded a few times to your real concern about the Russians interfering with the elections, but could you give some specifics of what exactly they did in 2016? Yeah. Um, in the book, probably the most controversial thing I say in the book that because of the magnitude of what the Russians did, that they actually, uh, they had profound impact on the outcome of the election uh, to the point that they could have turned it. Um, and the reason is, just by way of background, the Russians have a long history of interfering in elections, theirs and other people's. We have records going back to the 50s and 60s of the Russians attempting to interfere and influence the outcome of elections. But never, never as broad gauge and aggressive as when in the election in 2016. And of course the difference was their uh, pervasive use of social media. They reached about 123 million Americans with their messages of one sort, and they had messages for everybody. Black Lives Matter, white supremacists, pro-gun control, anti-gun control, pro-Muslim, anti-Muslim, pro-Jew, anti-Jew, didn't matter. 
And what they were doing, and they were, ver and unfortunately, we're a right target for this. They wanted to sow doubt, discord, and discontent in this country, and they succeeded to it fairly well with a fairly modest investment. When you consider that the election was settled on less than 80,000 votes in three states, which they targeted, to me, it stretches credulity to think they didn't have huge impact on the election. Now, I have to say, having said that, that the intelligence community assessment that we rendered in, Ju in January of, of, 26, of 17 and briefed President-elect Trump on made absolutely no call on the impact of the Russian uh, uh, activity on the outcome of the election. The Intelligence Committee has neither the authority nor the, the charter nor the uh, capability to make that judgment. But as a private citizen, knowing what I know of the pervasiveness of what the Russians did, its magnitude and its impact, that I, 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 I just, I couldn't come to any other conclusion. So this is a very serious thing for us. Uh, and you know, what, what to do about it? Well, apart, you know, sort of two bins is the way I think of it. Apart from all the sort of mechanical, administrative, technical things you can do to secure the voting apparatus, secure vo voter registration rolls, paper ballots, all that kind of thing. The more difficult issue is the other, the second bin is how do you get to people's minds so that they don't believe everything they see, read, or hear on the internet, particularly in, in a culture in our country which seems to lavish, revel in conspiracy theories, wacko conspiracy theories. And the Russians played on all that to a fairly well. They really go to school on us. They understand our society and our political environment far better than I think most people think. And for Putin, this is, a, this is goodness for him because of all, all the other weaknesses that Russia has, and they, they have some profound weaknesses long term, the outlook for Russia is not very good. But to the extent that he undermines us, weakens us, that by definition in his mind makes him, makes him and makes Russia stronger. And that's why uh, this, is, this is bad, and this is why, as I said, I'm going to do my little part to try to educate people about what I witnessed. Uh, in 15 and 16 in the run-up to the election. Uh, what, if anything, should we be doing about Assad and Syria? Well, that, that's an excellent question, and uh, I, I honestly don't know. Uh, Syria was, I would guess, the most intractable reg regional crisis that we dealt with, at least that I saw in the six and a half years I was DNI. And the reason is we could never come up with a viable alternative to Assad. The opposition groups were so fractionated. Uh, I remember one time we, we took a, a count of the opposition groups, some 15 or 1,600 opposition groups, and we could never come up with a group or certainly an ind individual who would be viable and uh, credible and appealing to the oppositionists that would be an alternative to, to Assad. And the absence of that and of course the Russians are committed to propping up their surrogate, Assad, a war criminal, because they, from a strategic perspective, want to maintain that beachhead to the Mediterranean, meaning Syria, which has long been a proxy of theirs going back you know, decades. So I don't know what we can do about it, and it is a, it is a disa humanitarian disaster of biblical proportions, what's happened in Syria. It will take decades, decades to recover and reconstruct. Uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, uh, 11 million displaced people, even either in Syria itself or, or out of the country. I mean, it's, it is, it's terrible. We're going to entertain one more question. Now he really has been up there for one hour, and then we will very much appreciate his having come. General, we've had uh, two presentations in this theater during the last year about 9-11 and the Pentagon bombing. And uh, the implications from that presentation was that there was no airplane that hit the Pentagon, that there was no remnants from a plane, there was no bodies found. And uh, so I just wondered if you could shed some light on that. 
Well, that's, uh, it doesn't comport with uh, uh, the evidence that uh, is pretty obvious to everybody, I think. Uh, you know, I, I don't know, I've seen the video clip of the American airliner uh, crashing into the uh, Pentagon. My son-in-law had two relatives on that plane. It was very real to him. So I, I don't, I mean, I, I know there are these revisionists out there, uh, you know, speaking of wacko conspiracy theories, um, but uh, it was very real to me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, let me just say uh, before I, I get, I'm getting the hook here. I got to leave. So. But uh, uh, yeah, so one, Walter Reed. one, yeah, I got to go to Walter Reed. I got an appointment. So, what a uh, wonderful audience you've been. I, I am uh, really touched and humbled by the turnout and uh, really, really excellent questions. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Jim is doing this for us just as a favor. Uh, we really have nothing to offer him other than our applause and our resident cartoonist, Mort Cohen, who has done a cartoon for him, and we would like to present that to him now. Mort. Yeah. It pertains to an episode in the book about uh, beating a dead horse. Yeah. yeah. Well, I didn't, I didn't go into this, but it's in the book. But what Moore's done up here is very, very clever. Um, old saw in Washington about, uh, you know, when you, you're, you're riding a dead horse, tribal wisdom says dismount. <laughs> but in Washington, we have other strategies. You know? <laughs> And you know, we'll get more whips to make the dead horse go faster, you know. So there's a whole litany of these. And my favorite was we promote the dead horse to a supervisor. <laughs> anyway, so Mort, very wonderful uh, cartoon. This, this is a keeper, Mort, so thank you very much. So he's rendered this in uh, that, that, uh, that bit about the dead horse to a cartoon, so thank you. <laughs>